So as you know, two weeks from today is Christmas Sunday, and if I continued on going through Book of Revelation on Christmas Sunday, it would not be a pretty picture. So we're not going to be in Revelation on Christmas Sunday. It'll be about the birth of Christ and what that means for all of us. So you'll you'll figure it out as we go through uh, Revelation chapter 8. But, um, you know, bottom line is God wants us to trust Him. Uh, he wants us to believe His Word. He wants us to realize that everything in His Bible is true. Everything that the Bible tells us is going to happen, is going to happen exa exactly as God tells us that it's going to happen. Don't forget that over one-fourth of the Bible is prophetic. It's about future events. Um, many of the things have taken place. There's many more things that have not yet taken place. But the Bible is the only book that has a 100% accuracy rate when it comes to predicting the future. And the simple reason is the Holy Spirit of God has uh, given us the Word of God, and He's the author of God's Word. And if God's Word was not fulfilled 100%, then it would be worthless. It would be no greater than any other religious book out there. But we know the difference is God fulfills what He has stated in His Scriptures. This is God's only living word, and we study it, we treasure it, we come to know who God is, we come to know his plans and purposes for our lives through the word of God, and it's only possible because he has revealed to us his love, he's revealed to us the reason why he created us, he, re he reveals to us what he's got in store for our future, and so what an amazing blessing we have because of God's word. And above all, he wants us to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ through the word of God. This is an honor for me to be able to teach God's word. It's a heavy duty responsibility to teach God's word. But what makes this such a joy is that I have complete confidence that it's not my opinion, but it's the word of God. And I'm blessed by the fact that so many of you guys believe this is God's holy word as well. Uh, I cannot imagine being part of a church that did not believe that this is God's word and God meant what he said and he says what he meant means. Uh, if that was the case, let's go skiing. If that was the case, let's go fishing. You know, why waste your time being here unless this is truly God's word? And again... It's the fact that God's Word is prophetic that separates the Bible from every other religious book. One of my favorite scriptures, God tells us in Isaiah 46, starting in verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Notice, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I mean, to me, that's incredible, because God knows everything is going to happen, and He is on the throne, and because He is in control, we can have confidence that He's going to bring to fruition everything He tells us. And we're looking at future events here in the book of Revelation. And we certainly need to be reminded constantly that God is sovereign. He is in charge. And again, especially as you go through Revelation, because we're looking at things that look like things are out of control. It looks like it's chaos. We're going to see lots of judgments and wrath and things that like, how in the world is this going to happen? And yet, there's a seven-year period called the Great Tribulation when everything is seemingly out of control, but God's in control. And he's allowing it to happen exactly as God's word lays out for us. And because of that, he has told us from the beginning what's going to happen in the end. This is why we call this the last days. This is the end of time. And so we're going to come into chapter 8 here. And we pick up in chapter 8. Um, we pick up the chronology of the book of Revelation. Remember in chapter 5, uh, the Father is on the throne. Jesus takes the scroll from the Father's right hand. I believe it's the title deed to planet Earth. Be that as it may, there are seven seals on this scroll. And in chapter 6, he begins to unloose each one of these seals. And as he does, tremendous weird things take place. 
with the opening of the first four seals, we see the Antichrist, when he opens the first seal, the Antichrist comes down to earth. He is the imposter. He pretends to be the Messiah, but he's a fake. He's a phony. And, um, you know, he's the final world ruler. He's the the head of the ten toes on the, remember the image that Daniel sees? Nebuchadnezzar has that dream. He sees the head of gold. That was Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire. He sees the chest of silver, the Medo-Persian uh, um, Medo Empire. Then he sees the bronze belly, which is the Greek Empire. He sees the legs of iron, which is the Roman Empire. And then the last days, it says, he sees ten toes, iron mixed with clay, and then ultimately he sees this mountain, not cut with hands, hits the image, destroys it all, sets up the kingdom of God. Well, that's Jesus at his second coming, and he's coming against the Antichrist in the last days. So anyway, when Antichrist shows up, he seems to be uh, you know, the greatest politician of all times, but it's going to quickly fall apart, as we saw with the opening of the second, third, and fourth seals. A fourth of the world's population is going to die during that time frame. Merry Christmas. <laughs> happy, happy, joy, joy. I mean, anyway, it's, it's brutal. Now, as we saw in chapter 7, there was a break in the action. After he opens the sixth seal, there's a break. We saw where God uh, seals and saves 144,000 Jewish men. And it's very clear from chapter 14 and chapter 7 who they are. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, even names which tribes they're from. And they're going to be like the Apostle Paul, 144,000 of them, running all over the place, preaching the gospel, calling people to repentance, telling people you need to turn to Jesus. But now, as we pick up in chapter 8, we see that Jesus removes the seventh seal. That's the name of the, the message, the title of the message, the seventh seal. This is not the end by any means, because when he opens the seventh seal, it brings on seven more judgments known as the seven trumpet judgments. That's not the end, because when the seventh trumpet judgment sounds, that brings on seven bull judgments, and that will be the end. And it gets worse with each step of the way. You know, the seven seals are bad enough, the seven trumpets are worse, but then the seven bowls are even more brutal. So we come to chapter 8 in the opening of the seventh seal. It says in verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, this is Jesus taking the scroll, he opens the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. We'll be there, we'll be watching how do you have time in eternity when you're standing in the, before the Lord? Apparently, we'll know it's a half hour. There's a, a, a silence. Uh, I think all of us have been in situations where you have a moment of silence. Somebody passed away or a tragedy happens and you're in a stadium or somewhere, or arena. Okay, let's take a moment of silence. And you usually have like 30 seconds of silence. Sometimes it's awkward. You'll hear people sneezing, <laughs> coughing you know, <clears throat> clearing their throats, you hear babies crying and all that kind of stuff. 30 seconds doesn't seem like very long, but it seems long, it seems awkward, but 30 minutes when it's absolute silence here in heaven for about half an hour. Billions of saints and angels have been worshiping the Lord in chapters 4 and 5, rejoicing in the presence of the Lord, and all of a sudden dead silence for 30 minutes. We'll see why here in a moment. I think it just brings on the reality, the awesomeness of what is about to take place. It just causes everybody in heaven just to pause in, si in silence. Um, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 13 says this, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. And we're going to see this as the calm before the storm. Verse 2, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Nobody knows exactly who these seven angels are, uh, but they stand before the Lord. They're not the four cherubim that circle the throne, you know, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. These are seven different angels, but we see they stand before the Lord, and their job at this time will be to take one of these seven trumpets each, and in succession, they will blow these trumpets, and when they do, 
John sees these horrendous things take place. Now, John is very familiar with trumpets. Uh, in fact, the trumpet is the number one mentioned instrument in the Old Testament, in the Bible. Um, it's mentioned 110 times in the scriptures, twice as many as the harp. Usually when people think of biblical instruments, they think of a harp. Well, you're going to sit on a cloud and play the harp. Nah. 110 times trumpets are mentioned. Paul knew, or John knew all about harp or trumpets. Um, it was very important to the history of Israel because a trumpet back then, it, it was like our, you know, Facebook, Twitter. I guess Twitter. You know, except for there was no covering up what that tweet meant. Uh, there was no hiding these tweets. No, the trumpet would sound and people knew what to do. The trumpet would sound and it was very clear because they had different trumpets for different things. Different notes meant different things. You'd have a trumpet sound, go to war. Trumpet sound, retreat. Trumpet sound, go to dinner. They had different trumpets. Trumpet was blown when the law was given on Mount Sinai. Remember when they come into the promised land, you know, Joshua was told to have the priests and everybody march around the walls of Jericho seven times. On the seventh time, blow the trumpets and then shout. And the walls, they came a-tumbling down, right? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, we saw the apostle John heard the voice of Jesus. He says it was like a trumpet. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, he hears the same voice. And that's when he's caught up into heaven. I believe that's when the rapture takes place. So the, the next trumpet sound you and I are waiting for will be the sound of the trumpet to call us home, for the bride of Christ to go home, to call us up into glory. That's the trumpet we are listening for, waiting for. The seventh trumpet in Revelation is not a trumpet we're going to hear on earth. We'll be with the Lord already. There's different trumpets for different reasons. The trumpets we're going to see are not for the bride of Christ. This is for a Christ-rejecting world. So, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up that's the word for rapture, harpazo, snatched away, caught up into the presence of the Lord, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 51, the Apostle Paul expounds on this when he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The last trumpet that calls us home to be with him. It's the last trumpet that he'll sound for the bride of Christ. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the trumpet we are waiting for is a sound of life. It's a sound of victory. It's a sound of resurrection. On the other hand, these seven trumpets are going to sound out judgment and wrath to all the inhabitants on the earth. These trumpets are not for us to experience, but we will be with John watching this take place. Before the trumpet sounds, John watches another amazing scene. Look at this in verse 3. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So again, another scene John would be very familiar with uh, in the Old Testament with the tabernacle and then later with Solomon's temple. They had this altar of incense. It was outside of the, the veil. You had the Holy of Holies on one side, then outside they had the altar of incense, and they would burn incense there, very beautiful fragrance, and once a year, well, not once a year, but the high priest would take coals from that altar of incense, he would put it in a gold censer, go into the Holy of Holies, he'd wave it before the Ark of the Covenant, and it represented the prayers of all the Israelites ascending up before the Lord. That was the picture. What we're looking at in heaven is the real deal. I mean, Heaven, is what we're looking at, New Jerusalem, that is the, the temple. That is the tabernacle. 
What Moses built, what Solomon built, were a replica or a model of what we see here in heaven. And so the high priest, as he waved that, it represented all the prayers of the people. Today, we can know that our prayers are being heard by the Lord. Um, our prayers go up as a sweet aroma to the Lord. Jesus is our mediator. He is intervening on our behalf. He's our high priest. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. As our high priest, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 24 tells us about Jesus, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able, also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so he hears our prayers. He's interceding on our behalf. Here in Revelation 8, this angel is offering up the prayers of all the saints before the throne of God. And these particular prayers could be from the martyred saints that we saw when the fifth uh, seal is open in chapter 6. We saw a, th a fourth of all the world was destroyed, and many of those become martyrs. There'll be more martyrs that we'll read about in Revelation. And they cry out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood on those who have done these things to us? And the answer that we saw back in chapter 6 is just a little bit longer. There's more brethren that are going to be martyred. They're going to come and join you. And that was in the future. But at the same time, this has been a common cry for, from God's people for millennia. How long, O oh Lord, are you going to allow can, you know, sinners, wicked people to continue to abuse to manipulate, to destroy your people. How long, O oh Lord, until you avenge you know, the innocence of those in the womb who've been aborted for no reason other than their pleasure? How long, O oh Lord, are you going to allow these atrocities to take place at the hands of wicked men and women? And the Lord will bring an end to it all during this time frame. A day is quickly approaching when Jesus himself will set up his kingdom on earth he will rule and reign in power and in glory and in truth and in righteousness and in peace and in joy. And what a glorious day that will be. But in the meantime, it's brutal and is going to be more brutal during the Great Tribulation. So look at verse 5. He's, he's got the prayers of the saints before the Lord. And now in verse 5 it says, Then the angel took the censer filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So that same censer, that golden censer that was filled with the prayers of the saints is now like a weapon here. It's a fiery weapon that God uses, and he throws it down to the earth in judgment. And it's interesting because this is one of the reasons why so many people have a hard time with God with Jesus, how could a God of love, how could a God of forgiveness also be a God of wrath and judgment? They can't reconcile in their minds how God can be both loving and wrathful. The answer, answer is quite simple, though. God is perfect. He is holy. No one imperfect, unholy can come into his presence. But because he loves us so much, he sent Jesus to die in our place and take upon himself the wrath, the judgment that we deserve for our sins. And because we're now in Christ, we're forgiven. That's the only reason why. It's not because we did anything good. We don't deserve it. It's solely because of God's goodness, his grace, his love and compassion in sending Jesus to take all of the wrath and judgment that we deserve upon himself as he hung on the cross. So anytime a, a sinful person like me receives Jesus Christ, the cloud of condemnation that was hanging over my head is taken away. And the banner of guilty you know, sinner is removed, and now I'm a, a saint. Now I'm declared righteous. Now I have a banner of, you know, washed in the blood of the Lamb, or whatever you might look at it that way. So you're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. But again, that cloud is instantly removed when you come to Christ by faith. It's all or nothing with God. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. Make believers don't go to heaven. 
People that go to church don't necessarily go to heaven. People that own Bibles don't necessarily go to heaven. You only go to heaven if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You received him as your Lord and Savior. It's all or nothing. John chapter 3, verse 36. It says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. All or nothing. In John chapter 5, starting in verse 22, Jesus himself says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son, Jesus, does not honor the Father who sent him. So all those religions out there that say, oh, Jesus is just a created being like all of us, or Jesus is Michael the archangel, a created being, or the spear brother of Lucifer, that's a lie. You're not honoring Jesus, because if you don't honor him as being God the Son, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, then you're not honoring the Father who sent his only begotten Son. Again, God is extreme. If you receive his love and forgiveness and grace, you receive eternal life. But if you reject his free gift of salvation in Christ, then it's eternal separation away from the presence of God, and you end up in a place we'll read about called the Lake of Fire. This is why we're not going to be teaching this Sunday morning on Christmas morning. <laughs> It's not a pleasant picture by any means. But this is not my opinion. This is what God's word tells us. Again, as this angel throws a censer that is filled with fire to the earth, the half hour of silence is now quickly gone. With, it says thunderings, voices, lightnings, an earthquake. Look at verse 6. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So it'll be in order. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So the first of these seven angels sounds the trumpet, a third of all the trees, that would be all the trees, think of every tree in the world. I mean, fruit trees, nut trees, indigenous trees, you know, fir trees, aspen, a third of the whole world's trees are burned up. All the green grass, when it says green grass, it literally means all the herbage. The first thing God created on the earth were trees and grasses, and it literally means the herbs of the field. So think of all the plants. Vegetable plants, all the herbage, all the herbs, grasses, hay, alfalfa. I mean, go through all of it now with this one judgment, it's all burned up. If all these things are burned up this way, that would quickly wipe out the food source for <laughs> most animals that graze, obviously. Uh, milk production, meat production would quickly dry up. And I don't know, if you're into chemistry and you want a burger made out of cells and all that stuff, I guess that might still happen for a while. But there's going to be so much that dries up at this time, burns up. There's a lot of speculation as you go through this. How exactly does this look? I have no idea. We're looking at things that come from heaven to earth. This is a judgment from God. There might be some natural explanations for some of these things, but other things we don't, we don't know. There, there's not any human explanation for this, as far as I can tell. We'll have to just wait and see. But we're going to stand there in awe, and we're going to be in utter amazement as God destroys his beautiful creation. Now, when God created this planet, he said it was very good when he was finished. And it was beautiful. I can't imagine how beautiful it was because now we're whatever, 6,000 plus years from the fall of mankind and it's been trashed pretty good. And as you look at the history of mankind, humans go to one of two extremes. At one extreme, you got people that don't care about planet Earth. 
They'll just, with greedy gain, you know, destroy, tear up, burn down, whatever they want to do. The other extreme is they want to worship it because this is Mother Earth to them and they ignore Father God. God placed us here to be good stewards over His creation. You know, it's like if I invited some of you to our house, I would be very upset if you thought our kitchen sink was a toilet. That's what we do to planet Earth. At the same time, I would be pretty upset if you came in and you started kissing our floor of our house and worshiping the house. That would be wrong too. Both are extreme. God wants us to be good stewards over his creation. It's God's world. He's going to destroy it all as we go through the Great Tribulation. At the end of this, when Jesus returns in a second coming and we come back with him, we see, as Jesus says in Matthew 24, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. This world will literally be on the brink of annihilation. But here's what we see in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. This is where we are as a, as a world today. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's why God's wrath is going to be revealed from heaven. And it's against those who suppress the truth. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them, how? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so you look at the world and you go, wow, what a beautiful creation. We have some beautiful things around Colorado, and that should lead you to say, wow, what a great creator there is. Instead of bowing down and worshiping the creature instead of the creator. Verse 21 says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Hello. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for, here it is, the lie. It's the indefinite article used there. The lie is the same lie that Adam and Eve fell for in the Garden of Eden when, you know, Lucifer, Satan, he's now fallen, Satan tempts Eve and says, you'll be just like God. Eat of this forbidden Oh, God's holding out on you. You'll be just like God. That's the lie that you don't need God. You are God, or you can become a God. we got a temple that's being built by the LDS over on Horizon Drive, and that's exactly what they promote. You will become a God if you buy into our system. It's the lie. Very clear. It's the lie that you don't need God. You are a God, or God wants you to become a God like him. That's the lie. So they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the, the prophet Habakkuk says, in wrath, Lord, remember mercy. And he does. He does it throughout the book of Revelation. His desire is for people to repent of their sins, turn to Christ for salvation, and sometimes God will make people feel very uncomfortable in their life, but it's always with the intention of getting their attention. That ever happened to you? It happened to me. God had to get my attention before I realized I was a sinner I mean, I was living for the world, the flesh. I was doing my own thing, and then he got my attention. The way he did it was for me. He does different things for different people. Bottom line is, you come to a place where you realize, my life is empty. My life is meaningless. I have no hope in anything beyond this world. And the Holy Spirit came to convict the world, Jesus said, of sin. I realized when he convicted me, I'm a sinner of righteousness, 
I was unrighteous of judgment. I'm going to be judged because I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that is what God is doing on a much larger scale with these judgments. He's putting the pressure upon this world to get people's attention. And so he's going to wake them up to their empty lives, an emptiness that can only be filled and satisfied by Jesus. Look at the second trumpet here in verse 8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like, so it's kind of like this, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. So you can picture that in your mind, whatever that looks like. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. This is truly an amazing scene that John witnesses here. This something like a burning mountain that's thrown into the sea and it kills a third of all the sea creatures. It destroys a third of all the ships in the ocean. Again, I don't know exactly what this is, um, but it's very specific. Possibly John is seeing some kind of a comet, asteroid, meteor coming through the atmosphere hitting the ocean. Here's a thought. Uh, Three-fourths of our planet is water. One-third of all the water in the world is the Atlantic Ocean. So just speculating, if this comet, meteorite, or whatever it is, hits and slams into the Atlantic Ocean, it would wipe out everything in the ocean. All the sea creatures. It would cause tsunamis. It would cause you know, tidal waves. I could see it flipping over a third of all the ships because there's about 45,000 freighters on our oceans throughout the world. So if a third of them are wiped out, that's 15,000. Um, think of all the yachts, all the military you know, ships out there, a third of them destroyed. It would be a, an amazing catastrophe. A third, maybe every living creature in the Atlantic Ocean dies at this time. This is what Jesus says. Luke 21, starting in verse 25, says, Then there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations. That's going to be happening with perplexity. People are perplexed. What in the world's going on? The sea and waves roaring. So maybe that's what's the picture here. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So that's just the second trumpet. So now we have the third trumpet here. Look at verse 10. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, from the universe. And I mean, it's not from God's heaven. This is heaven referring to the atmosphere. A great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. Interesting that it has a name. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. This great star has a specific mission. It, it poisons a third of all the world's freshwater supplies. You looking for Kelly? Uh, it poisons a third of all the freshwater supplies. Again, the Greek word used for star here is the Greek word aster. It's where we get the word for asteroid. Um, apparently, this is a large asteroid. It hits the Earth's atmosphere, and as it comes in, it's, it's, you know, burning up, and probably dust from this asteroid, poisonous, pollutes, destroys, makes bitter uh, a third of all the fresh water supplies in the world. This would be brutal. Most people don't realize it at this point because verse 11 says that many people died from this bitter water. Um, some of you, most of you, so, well, I don't know, half of us, I'll go with that, are old enough to remember 
1986, 36 years ago, um, when Chernobyl, which is in Ukraine, it was a nuclear power plant, when that went through its meltdown, and the initial blast of Chernobyl wasn't that bad. Only two people died from that initial blast. But over the next 20 years, they had tens of thousands of people die of radiation poisoning. They had multiple, I mean, huge amounts of birth defects. I mean, it affected a huge area, not just in Ukraine, but in Russia, in that part of uh, Eastern Europe. I mean, it was nasty. And it was only about six or seven years ago they reopened that area that you could go, and they had tours of Chernobyl, like you'd really want to do that. But, you know, if you want to light up your life a little bit, I guess you can go to where there's a nuclear reactor. Remember when Russia invaded um, Ukraine earlier this year? That was one of the big hot spots they were protecting was Chernobyl because it's still active. And they didn't want that getting blown up again and make it even worse. Now, interesting thing, the Russian word for Chernobyl means wormwood. <laughs> Why would you name a nuclear power plant wormwood? Chernobyl. It's a wor word that simply means bitter water. There's a great story in the book of Exodus. Remember when the Israelites come out of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, and they're three days journey and they're getting very thirsty. They come to this pond of water and it's bitter. And as they call it Mara, you know, it's bitter water. They couldn't drink it, it'd make them sick. So they start grumbling and complaining. And this is what we read in Exodus 15, starting in verse 24. It says, And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Interesting. The tree is a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ and what the cross has done for us. Um, the tree is mentioned as the cross in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so just as that tree thrown into the bitter waters of Mara made the water sweet, when you receive Jesus Christ into your bitter, sinful life, Jesus will make your life sweet. He gives you rivers of living water. So it's quite the opposite of what we see here. Now, 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, that's the sanctification process, it is the power of God. So this third trumpet judgment, it's against those who are rejecting the Lord, they're rejecting the word of God. They don't want Jesus, they'd rather have bitterness. They, 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 that's what they're experiencing, the bitter waters that God gives them as a judgment. Look at verse 12. Then the fourth angel sounded... And a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. So this, this is great, incredibly weird. The first three judgments affects a third of all mankind. This one affects everybody. Because when you darken a third of the sun, you got a third less energy hitting the earth. Again, what's that going to do to the crops that are left? Um, there's something known as a nuclear winter. And a nuclear winter, science says, takes place when there are 100 nuclear weapons that explode simultaneously. If 100 nuclear weapons went off and I imagine that's going to be something that happens during the Great Tribulation. Maybe this is when it happens. It causes a nuclear winter with all the soot, with all the carbon, with all the, it's called black carbon. Um, it'll cover the whole earth in a matter of days. And it would drop the temperature of the earth 30 to 40 degrees almost instantly. I mean, that's crazy. A nuclear winter. During the Great Tribulation, this will only last for a short time because when we get to the fourth bowl judgment, that's in chapter 16, verse 8, 
It says the sun is heated up and it scorches everybody that's on the earth. And so crazy things are going to happen. Again, climate change, it's going to happen. What we're seeing today is not climate change. Oh, yeah, it's gone up a, one degree in the last hundred years. Wait till this time of frame. Man, when it goes up, down, all over the place, drops 30, 40 degrees, goes up to 30 or 40 degrees above what anybody's used to, it's going to be brutal. Look at verse 13. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa! Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. In other words, the last three trumpet judgments are going to be much worse than the first four. And as we'll see in chapter 9, Lord willing, if we're still here next week, these judgments from God in chapter 9 they move from the natural realm, like we're looking at here, to the supernatural realm where demons will be involved. God is going to let loose demons all over this planet. It's going to be the unrestrained version. Right now, as bad as this world is, as wicked as things are, we are under the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit within the power within the church. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working through the church that restrains evil from totally taking over. When we're removed and the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is gone, because the church is gone, we're going to see in chapter 9 what the unrestrained version looks like. None of us should ever desire that anyone should go through the Great Tribulation. This is God's wrath. This is his judgment upon those who have rejected the love, the forgiveness that Jesus offers them. Paul says to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2 that these people will perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So again, it's all or nothing with God. What about you? Do you know where you're going when you die? Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? That's the bottom line. You know, I don't care how good or bad your life is right now. Well, I do, but when you die, that's what matters. Where are you going when you take your last breath? There's no guarantee you, are, you got tomorrow. People die every day. I look at the obituaries all the time. I'll be in there unless the rapture takes place first. But let me close with these scriptures because, again, you have to make a choice. Are you going to receive Christ or are you going to reject him? First scripture, look at this in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. That's what we're looking at in Revelation. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be he, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? They just walked all over Jesus, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, just saying, ah, his blood didn't do anything for me and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, and we know the Lord. This is what we're seeing in Revelation. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Again, this is why you and I, we don't go around blowing up abortion clinics. We pray for people. This is why you and I don't stick a gun to anybody's head or a sword to their throat saying convert or die. Some religions do that, but that's not what Christians are supposed to do. Some have done that. They're misrepresenting Jesus because we know God is the final judge, not us. We give them good news. We give them hope that if they come to Christ, they can be saved. Again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We don't want to fall into the hands of the living God by rejecting him. But this is what Jesus says. If for those who place their faith and trust in him for salvation, you fall into his loving arms. John 6, 35. 
And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. People during the tribulation are going to be starving. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. People in the tribulation, they're going to be dying of thirst, bitter waters. Jesus will give us rivers of living water. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. So you got to come to the Lord, trusting that he loves you. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Praise the Lord.